Welcome to the Commonwealth Club of California and the Michelle Miao Show from the Commonwealth Club. Michelle and I are here at the uh, Toby Family Auditorium at the otherwise almost deserted Commonwealth Club building in San Francisco. And we have a special guest who will be joining us today via Zoom teleconferencing. And you're, of course, all watching us online or listening to this podcast later on. Uh, if you're following us on YouTube Live, go ahead and submit any questions for our speaker today. There, you to, yeah, I can't speak now. Use the chat feature, excuse me, right next to the, the video window, and we'll try to work some of those into our, our conversation today. We're, we have a lot to talk about, so we're very excited about it. Before I hand off to Michelle, I just want to note that uh, at the Commonwealth Club, we are doing all of our programs live, online, without an audience, uh, in person that is, so uh, we're presenting these free. And if you would like to know what other programs we have coming up, go to commonwealthclub.org slash online. We've got a lot of stuff there and we're adding new stuff every day. And also you can find out from uh, at the same place how to help support us during this time. Now, I'm John Zipper. I'm the Commonwealth Club's Vice President of Media and Editorial. And one of my great treats in life is co-hosting Michelle Miao's programs here at the club. So now let's please welcome Ms. Michelle Miao. Thank you so much for joining us. If you're joining for the first time, the Michelle Miao Show is your A through Z covering the LGBT, LMNOP, and everyone in between. We are so excited to have our special guest here with us today via Zoom. Uh, he is the first out gay elected teacher in San Francisco. He's a stand-up comedian, a politician, an activist, and a lot of other things, but today he's the author of his new memoir, Kiss My Gay Ass, My Trip Down the Yellow Brick Road Through Activism, Stand-Up, and Politics. Please welcome Tom Amiano. Tom, welcome to the show. Hello there. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I just can't put this book down. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Tom, I decided that today I'm going to procl proclaim this day as Kiss My Gay Ass Day, or Tom I, I, Day. How about that? I, I like it. I'll, I'll, I'll even waive my uh, royalties. <laughs> it, maybe uh, one of the gay uh, virtual marches, parades, entertainment we do in June. Uh, we can say that's our slogan or something on that order. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Hey, well, listen, I have something to share with you. While I was promoting this talk, I was also promoting a bunch of other stuff that was coming up, um, such as a program on abortion rights, a program on Lao Cambodian Thai New Year. And I got some feedback. There were people who were offended that I would include the cover of your book, Kiss My Gay Ass, with all these other speakers. Um, and said, you know, I don't have anything against the LGBTQ community, but I just think that that's offensive language. And so some of these other speakers shouldn't be grouped into the same platform. It's not appropriate. And I, I was so mad. I was so angry about it. And I wanted to respond and I wanted to do this. And I wanted to tweet and I wanted to call you and, a, you know, <laughs> and, a, and all this stuff. But then because, um, you know, I really think that they should to they should read the description of the book. But why don't we start there? Sure. You, you know, it's something, the book get, Kiss My Gay Ass. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, it's something um, that, uh, you know, people feeling um, what's appropriate or not appropriate. You know, I'm very familiar with that, um, especially because uh, comedy. When we first started, you know, there was no out gay comics, no Marga, no Leah Deliria. Uh, and um, there were those who would come uh, from the uh, queer community and then um, walk out. They would be offended because they didn't think we should be uh, not only out, but we shouldn't be critical of each other. Um, and that's just what what's going to happen. I mean, I think some of the people uh, uh, and I think they're a minority. Um, you know, they're good people. Uh, they just need to put it in context. I can't tell them what they need to do. Um, you know, not buying the book is fine if that's what it is. But uh, uh, it's just something that's very familiar. No, no, no. But 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 see, kiss my gay ass though actually has some context and there's background to it. And you actually shouted these words and and. Uh, yeah, you know, it's a beautiful story. Tell it. It involves Governor well, or then yeah. Governor Schwarzenegger. <laughs> well, um, once a year, there's a big to do at uh, one of the big hotels, 
and it's all for the workers. It's all for rank and file uh, membership and, and the Democratic Party and, you know, the, the whole Megillah. And so uh, it's very sweet. Lots of people come, uh, they look forward to it, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, they're in the trenches and people get dressed up and there's the great diversity of San Francisco, you know, every ethnicity, you hear every language and it's very hoo-ha, the, the uh, ballroom is with the chandeliers and uh, it's, it's just, and, and uh, people are happy. So I don't know how this happened. Uh, I mean, in the book, I go into it in a little more detail, uh, but our, somebody thought it'd be a good idea, Willie Brown, that Arnold Schwarzenegger happened to be staying there. And so they thought, wouldn't it be great if Arnold came to this dinner? Wrong. First of all, he had just vetoed a number of bills, including the gay marriage bill that Mark Leno had submitted. Uh, and he also had vetoed lots of labor bills and that, you know, that hurt people's uh, pocketbook. So uh, I, I thought it was really uh, rude that he should come. And then all of a sudden he's on stage and uh, started to joke around uh, and the crowd went nuts, you know, and part of the crowd reaction was me going kiss my gay ass. I was so insulted by the fact that he was there. And of course we're all encouraging each other. You know, we're talking five, 600 people, you know, all it was like Les Miserables, you know, <laughs> but all really, you know. Uh, and so that's uh, that's that story. And then uh, an adjunct to that is most likely as a um, punishment, he vetoed a bill uh, of mine that was really what we call a nothing burger. Uh, even the Republicans that supported this bill uh, had something to do with the port and financing, it really. Uh, it, you know, it was very prosaic. And so he vetoed this bill and it was very boilerplate. I'm not going to uh, support this bill. It's very, and uh, my staff was so smart. They looked at it and looked at it and they found uh, uh, an acrostic. And the first letter of every sentence, if you read it from the top to bottom, was I, F, U, C, K, Y, O, U. So that was the veto that made a little history too. And uh, of course I said, I refuse his offer and his veto. So there you are. <laughs> well, Tom, you've been in the public eye, in the center of the public eye here in, in San Francisco for decades. Your book takes us way back to when you first got off the Greyhound bus into San Francisco. Why don't you kind of start there? Kind of like what what changes were going through your life at that time, and did you have any idea that this was going to be your home for the next for the rest of your life? No, but I think there was something uh, hidden that you know I did know. I don't want to get all Doctor Phil here, but uh, you know I was anxious to get out of New Jersey. No reflection on my family and friends, uh, but New Jersey can be very restricting, especially in the fifties. Uh, you know, and, and you're a big fag. So um, I happened to read a magazine uh, one time and it said there was Turkish baths in San Francisco and that known homosexuals went there. So I thought, well, sign me up. You know, I was only uh, 18 or 19. And uh, at those days, uh, it was politically incorrect, but what kids listened to were instead of gaming, like today was uh, cops and robbers and cowboys and Indians. So I used to fantasize that I would leave home and go live on a ranch with Tab Hunter. And we, we would have cows in a buckboard. And of course, Tab would always be wearing tidy whities So that was one of my motivations for getting on the Greyhound bus. And... Um, winding up in San Francisco, which immediate dislike. It was uh, July, it was cold, it was damp. I was looking for Gidget. So it, it took quite an adjustment uh, in the early days to really fall in love with the city like we all do. You talk about getting into education and, and becoming an educator, kind of almost like you fell into the, the hole or the role, uh, but 
I, yeah. I particularly like you, you, you opening that up with the story of going to Vietnam during the Vietnam War, um, going to teach English, and, and when many people, uh, obviously, you know, would not go. Uh, talk to us or share that story and how you ended up in a, I think it was a, a, a water pot. Uh, as a water yeah. cistern above a toilet. Yes, I will. Right, right. Well, how would you like to do this? I can read a segment about Vietnam. Okay. Uh, and I think it would kind of directly answer um, your question, except for, of course, you know, where was my mind when I did it? I mean, that I understand. So in Vietnam, they called me uh, Ein Tom. The letters T-O-M with a little hat accent over the little O mean shrimp in Vietnamese. So Mr. Tom, Ein Tom means little Tom because the Vietnamese would always say to me, Mr. Tom, Americans are so fat and you're not fat. Why is that? There you are. The Tet Offensive happened in 1968. Right before it happened, my neighbor knocked on my door and said, Mr. Tom, would you mind if I stayed with you tonight? I said, sure, but I thought that's unusual. I mean, they live right next door. Of course, they knew what was gonna happen. <clears throat> then we heard these guns going off. That was in the countryside. And we were in a little regional town. And my neighbor said, uh, I think we should get under the bed. Well, duh. I finally knew for sure that something was happening. <clears throat> of course, it was the Tet Offensive. It was February, 1968. The next morning, the neighborhood family came to me and asked me, would you accept people fleeing from the countryside? Because you know the real people are always caught in the middle. The North Vietnamese, the South Vietnamese, they were all just rural people. They all needed shelter. So I thought, well, I have this place. So they all came in, close to 70 people, babies and everything. <clears throat> they were all packed into my little house. And they said to me, <clears throat> Mr. Tom, we wondered if you uh, could ask you to hide. And I said, well, sure, uh, because the deal was if the North Vietnamese came in and saw me, uh, there with them, uh, then we'd all be dead. I had a little water tank in the house and I could hide in it. A little cistern above the shower and toilet. It was a squat toilet. So I went up there and got in there. There was no water because there'd been a drought. <clears throat> it was very much a scene straight out of Carlos Castaneda. There was a little gecko lizard in there and I had a whole conversation with it. That's why I have a gecko tattoo on my ankle. So there's that. And were you scared going through that, or was this an adventure? Yes, I was. I was. I was also young. Yeah. And um, um, I was really worried about the people because they could have been punished mm -hmm. for hanging out with me, even though they didn't know me. They came, like I mentioned, you know. Yeah. The war affect just like everything. The war itself affected people who were the most disenfranchised the rural people, the poor people. Um, there was a lot of class issues in Vietnam. And of course, this was a civil war. You know, it was Vietnamese first. And then we had to put our big, you know, nose into their affairs. So um, anyway, that was one experience in the two years I was there. Was that the point in, um, in which you said to yourself you wanted to continue as an educator? I mean, you came back and... Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, a couple of things happened, but you know, when I um, came to uh, San Francisco in the, the early 60s, I mean, obviously I had to pay the rent and uh, I did have a BA, so this is a little TMI. So I decided uh, that teaching could be a way. Um, you know, I'm, I always like kids. My family has a lot of kids. I grew up with, with a lot of kids and um, uh, had some interests because of previous employment at a camp for the handicap in special ed, so it all kind of came together. And I went for my master's at San Francisco State while working at uh, uh, camps for the handicapped and for the uh, uh, recreation center for the handicapped down there on um, on the big, on, big, on the, it's not the big highway, what is it called? The great highway, big, great, tomato, <laughs> tomato. And uh, so that's where I got my credential and my basic education. And then when I went to Vietnam, I taught English as a second language at a, a local high school. 
I always say all those children and students now speak English with a New Jersey accent. This is a dog. <laughs> uh, when coming back to San Francisco, 1968, what am I going to do to pay the rent? Can't go for, don't look like a go-go dancer. I don't think I can do wealth management. So uh, I continued my path towards teaching and uh, uh, started teaching for the district, uh, the Unified, at the uh, beginning of 69, right after I came back. Just to rub everyone's nose in it, you mentioned in the book what you paid for rent for your apartment in San Francisco back oh, then. God. How much it, was it? It was, uh, and I thought it was high. <clears throat> it was furnished. I had a boyfriend, we lived together. It was a one bedroom, big kitchen, um, a bathroom, uh, part of five units uh, in an old Victorian on 16th between Deviz and, um, and, uh, and Market, $145. <laughs> a week? I thought it was too much and the guy never fixed the toilet either. Yeah, so a month, right? $145 yeah. a month. He drank a lot, the landlord. <laughs> Which is, you know, I don't, you know, that I don't care about that. But he never would have a drink with me because I think he was a little, you know, afraid. Yeah. Maybe yeah. I'd make a move. Hardly, but you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have a lot to cover. I certainly, you know, want to bring up some uh, of, of the politics and the bills that you've passed, the elected leaders that you've rubbed shoulders um, or not with. <laughs> but yeah, or but, rub something. I don't know. Yeah. That's it. That's in the next book. <laughs> yeah. But let's let's briefly talk about also, you know, your your time as um, an activist, as an out gay teacher coming out. You know, we've shared coming out stories here on the show all the time. And some people uh, will share the first time that they thought uh, or they knew that they're LGBTQ. But your coming yeah. out was uh, to the media and and also, you know, with an activist hat on. So we can talk about. Um, that moment in which, you know, you fought yeah. for non-discrimination policy, uh, fought the school board. And it was, what, yeah. it, it was what they call a perfect storm. I mean, I always knew that I was gay, gay in utero. I, you say I, I redecorated it while I was in utero. You know, uh, I mean, I know some people struggle, some people don't know, you know, look at your dreams, I always say. Uh, but I knew from the beginning and people treated me like the other too. And it, uh, obviously, uh, I share that with a lot of LGBT and Q people and, and uh, other people who feel different or are made to feel different. So it wasn't always pleasant, but you do develop tools and skills. And uh, one of them was, uh, you know, being funny. And um, uh, I uh, did always have a sense of uh, wanting to write situations. So personally, I couldn't articulate it, but I knew how I was being treated um, about being, you know, perceived of, of, of being a sissy uh, was was not right. How do I write that? I never thought the words, but of course, escape was a good was a good idea, and I did, and I escaped to San Francisco. Um, and like I say, you know, I, I I cared a lot for my family and some of my friends, but you know, it was bigger than them. It really was, and um, so San Francisco just had a lot of activism happening around me. And I think I had a proclivity towards that. So, uh, you know, I did work with the disabled and there was, you know, quite a lot wrong with uh, society and how they dealt with the disabled. Uh, and then I went into special ed and uh, uh, the special ed kids were treated horribly uh, in those days by the school district. They were labeled forever and their true potential was never. So, and then um, there was a women's movement happening. There was a civil rights movement happening. There was the anti-Vietnam movement and percolating was the LGBT movement. And, you know, as I found my uh, feet in San Francisco, which was basically meant, you know, making friends because friends are your family. I've always felt that and I always feel so grateful for the friendships I've had and made, uh, you know, the gay men that I got to know, my sisters, <clears throat> you know, all that. Um, and I had a lot of straight friends who were in teaching and I uh, just got sick of the homophobia um, on the playground, of course, but 
most of the name calling came in the faculty room. Mm -hmm. And that really sucked. Uh, and, you know, as a teacher, I just felt this, this is wrong. And um, I did get involved with uh, some people of like thinking who were not really happy with the gay bar scene in the sense of it really discriminated. Discriminated against women, African-American people, um, what you look like. Um, I thought, if this is gay liberation, I don't feel it. Hmm. Um, so I happened to see, by luck, a poster that advertised a meeting that said to, in effect, are you tired of the gay bars? You know, in those days, gay bars all over, I mean, New York, et cetera, you know, the Stonewall, some, some of those were mafia owned and they didn't really give a shit about the clientele. And you had that terrible uh, fire in the gay bar set on purpose in New Orleans. So, you know, all this is turning uh, uh, and this flyer just struck a note with me. And I checked it out. I usually don't like things like that at all. And uh, that turned out to be an organization that only lasted one year called BAGEL, Bay Area Gay Liberation. But it really, trans it was transformative. Uh, it was nutty, it was eccentric, and it always wasn't pleasant. But um, I learned a lot and informed me. And that's, and that's informed my political career too, the, the role as an activist. And I got to know wonderful lifelong friends, um, you know, who are with us. Uh, I mean, I was just a lucky guy. So, and, and then Harvey happened, of course, and then the murders happened. I'm really just giving you snapshots. And all that uh, tended to radicalize and motivate me um, to get involved in the, in the way I've been involved. You know, mm -hmm. um, I even ran for office. In 1979, I got about five votes or something, but it was a great experience. And it taught me that I think I'm going to go into comedy now. So <laughs> I took a break from running for about, uh, you know, 15 years. Well, let's stick with politics for a second, just because we, we talk with a lot of politicians who talk about how they deal with activists. And we talk about a lot of activists and their attitudes toward politicians. You, of course, have done both. When you became an elected official, did you still always see yourself as a, as an activist? Just in well, I, again, I think it informs you. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, you, that's your history. And uh, it, it's also an identity. Yeah, I do. But there, Harvey Milk was a good, you know, role model in this sense, because his leadership came from the people. Uh, uh, he listened to whoever his constituency was going to be. Uh, and it wasn't narrow. It w was certainly uh, queer, but it was also drawing and connecting the dots to other disenfranchised communities. Um, you know, uh, Donald Trump has kind of uh, trashed uh, the meaning of populist, but it's not really what Donald Trump is. Um, it's kind of what Harvey was. You know, and I always felt I took that with me when I got elected. And uh, I also um, felt that the uh, way I was going to do legislation and help out was to be a conduit, um, you know, to um, the constituency, the people who wanted things done around, especially social justice. So one story that's not in the book, uh, when I got elected, uh, especially uh, to the Board of Soups. I mean, the, the AIDS crisis was raging and um, there wasn't much being done about it uh, in the way that we would have liked. And um, I'm going to pick on Kaiser now, but, uh, and Kaiser is quite different, but there was a, a number of demonstrations by ACT UP and others uh, against Kaiser. They even said Kaiser equals death because they, I mean, to be brief, they didn't have any standards of care uh, for HIV, even though it was raging in San Francisco. And there was verified homophobia. And as soon as I got on the board, um, the activists and the active people that I knew said, we need relief, we need something here, this is ridiculous. Um, and so I was able, 
uh, through my office as supervisor to get everybody in a room and lock the door. And uh, we, we worked it out uh, in a way that Kaiser eventually did a 180. Of course, nothing's ever perfect, but they came up with standards of care. And, you know, frankly, a lot of it was a class thing. Um, a lot of the people from Kaiser that we met with, with the angry activists, uh, you know, they were, they might have been doctors, but they were removed. They're administrators, you know. So I guess you could say I brought it home. Mm -hmm. And I've always been comfortable doing that. There are lots of stories in the book that you tell about um, just being able to deal with the press and the media <laughs> and they they were not kind to you no. even local no. press i mean no. um for they example have my obituary when, written like 80 years of, you know <laughs> <laughs> to show you what they're yeah well um, like, i mean in particular i wanted to bring out a story you told um when you started the speakers bureau with hank wilson and you know the, oh. this bureau is you both of you going into classrooms and uh, just talking about, uh, you know, LGBTQ stuff, but so many people and even uh, closeted gay teachers or parents or, you know, really did not want you to do this. And no. lots of journalists would write stuff about you being a pervert or talking about, you know, sexual compliment uh, positions now, and objects. I, yeah. I mean, these are, this is just an example, but how did you, I guess, overcome that and just tell yourself like I'm not a monster I'm not what they say I am um and just like you just kept going like how did how well, did you, you know I, I I give a lot of credit to the the friends I made because you know once you know once you are affirmed you know once you make that hurdle um it it doesn't go away you know and um I did have a a, a circle of support now, you know, part of the media's issue with me was not only being out, but how I was out. You know, I'm not the butchest thing in the world. You know, I don't think I need to worry about toxic masculinity too much. You know, every guy has his own issues, of course, uh, gay or straight or femme or whatever. Uh, you know, sexism is sexism. But um, um, that made them uncomfortable. And then I leaned left, and that made them even more uncomfortable. So... Uh, when I got elected, I was also doing comedy, and that made them uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> so they actually, I, I tell it in the book, they actually assigned a reporter to follow me to my different gigs and, you know, th then insinuate through headline and all that how inappropriate I was to be on the school board. So, um, uh, and I did have my struggles on the school board with other school board members. Um, they didn't want me to touch certain uh, things. Well, AIDS education, condoms in the school. Oh my God, they freaked out. The meetings went till 4 a.m. Um, they sent the religious channel there. The, the interesting thing is a, a newspaper. I don't want to embarrass them. So I'll just tell you it's initials. The San Francisco Chronicle <laughs> did everything they could about how inappropriate even later on with domestic partners, it all was, but especially they hated the Boy Scouts. <clears throat> the Boy Scouts, as we know, were homophobic and now look, um, but they could meet in the schools. And there's some act called the Civil Civil Something Act, Civil Service Act. I, it's a, anyway, it allows even Nazis, if you wanted to use a school building after school, um, you, they couldn't deny you this. And my point was we had a non-discrimination clause and yet the teachers that we were paying, the Boy Scout leaders who were going in and teaching after and before, uh, they would recruit um, during the school time. But then they would you know, have the meetings after uh, when the law actually allowed it, that that would violate our, our, uh, you know, our, um, non-discrimination clause and that you know, caused a, a, an enormous you know blowback you can imagine and um uh it it really um it took a while but i will say one thing for our community there were straight friends of the political class all right so the political class knows each other queer and and straight and in those days, the straight ones were trying to curry favor. You know, we had become the issue du jour. 
right? So if you got Alice's endorsement or Harvey's endorsement, that didn't mean they followed through. I, I from my mouth to God's ear. So when they went to the queer community and said, Tom is going too far, absolutely too far to Boy Scouts, people love them and all that stuff. The community stood by me. So it's always been sustenance from those around, even my family, maybe not so much on the gay issue, you know, the sophistication had to come later and all that. But I, I give a lot of credit in, in, to that, that background. You know, all of these, these issues and, and battles and opponents you've had over the years, what was your biggest challenge? Maybe the one that you, you know, really just, whether it was the biggest problem or your biggest difficulty in, in addressing it and, and, and battling it? Well, I, I think my political perspective, gay, gay being important, but, you know, um, my, my, for better of a lack of term, my left lean, not so mainstream in how I thought about issues, mm -hmm. women's issues, disabled issues, uh, social justice issues. I mean, I was, I was, I was a knife, you know, I was not sophisticated. I didn't really have an ideology. Um, I used to make jokes about tight Trotsky butts and broad Stalinistic soldiers, shoulders. That went over well. <laughs> um, but, you know, it was just that sense, not morally, but, you know, what was right and what was wrong, just to be simplistic. Mm -hmm. um, um, and um, I think it was a perfect storm of me landing here, seeing some interesting things happening socially and addressed. You know, you didn't talk about it in New Jersey, but in San Francisco, you there would be, oh, the great community, or, you know, there'll be a women's march. You know, so and, uh, what I loved the most, and I wasn't, I had to live in Berkeley in the beginning for a, a, a couple of months, and everybody thought I was a student there. So I, you know, I did identity theft. I <laughs> pretended I was a student. Everybody thought I was. I had my little bag. And then there was the free speech movement. God was good. Wow, free fucking speech. I love it. And they did touch on the gay issue. Not like, uh, you know, you really want, but enough. And Mario Savio and, and Bettina Aptiger and Mario was Italian. Oh my God. It, it, anyway, it opened up a lot of doors. So again, osmosis, you know. Well, let's get into the uh, the politics. I mean, I, I really wanted to dive into maybe some some juicy stuff. You added some juicy stuff in the book, but through your political career, you have uh, you know served alongside some of the well known uh, elected leaders today, such as our current governor, uh, Gavin Newsom. Yeah. Uh, you guys served together, you know, during your days as board of supervisor. You ran against Mayor Willie Brown, um, have certainly worked with, uh, we mentioned Governor Schwarzenegger, uh, yeah. lot, lots of people, Nancy Pelosi, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, uh, Diane Feinstein. Um, my question is, likability, I think I think what I get out of you sharing all these stories and, um, you know, running against certain people or trying to pass a bill, uh, the success that you had, I think you never really looked at it from the perspective that you had to be well liked, not, you know, with your peers and not with people who might uh, have voted against you or didn't support you. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to ask, I mean. I, I, well, you know, it's the heart of, uh, I guess you would say something like kiss my gay ass to the governor at the time if you, I mean, you didn't really care what people thought what you thought, but yeah, uh, did you really kind of go about well, things to be liked or not? Well, you, uh, you know, not, not purposely, I always, I always look for a connection, you know, um, and um, if that happens, sometimes you can get around the attitudes. Now, like, I mean, I was on, on the board of soups for 14 years and I had very strong likes and dislikes. Um, and mostly it came from policy, but sometimes it came from personality. Um, but yeah, I always did, I always did my best. So speaking of, um, all right, I'll let you wait for the, I, 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 I was going to tell you something. So now I'm going to tease you, uh, uh, read the book. But uh, sometimes there were riffs 
um, that were not really healed. Sometimes time went on. Um, the only way I could put it in simplistic terms is uh, using Diane Feinstein. I think she's a good signature, you know, because she's been around for so long. Diane, uh, especially around Harvey's time and all that, Diane was the, not the do-gooder, but the establishment, just for the sake. And so, and then we were the rebels. Uh, so there was a, a, natu a natural uh, inborn conflict anyway. Now, conflict doesn't always have to be bad because you're learning the ropes. You're learning a little uh, something about your adversary. Um, and uh, hopefully you take, th you take that uh, and um, if you're stripped down to your core, there's things you can't change about yourself and that's just how it is. And there's commitments and that's just how it is. But after that, there are steps that you can take to deflect it, uh, not necessarily to accommodate it, but to live with it. You know, I'm an old hippie, so uh, peaceful coexistence. And then the other thing, I mean, candidly, everybody likes a good fight, you know. What you have to be careful is there are people who want you to fight with each other or, uh, or with whoever the mayor is and because of their benefit. So you have to be kind of clear about what what you're thinking, and uh, you know, I was, death penalty uh, comes to mind. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, if, if folks who were on the other side of arguments with you, and maybe even some really heated disagreements, did any or many of them become friends, or at least friendly to you later on? Have, have any of them come to you later on and say, you know what, I was so wrong back then when I was opposing this right or that thing? Yeah, well, the political class doesn't admit anything unless uh, I'm quitting my job because I want to be with my family. <laughs> Your family hates you. And what about that accountant, the Caymans? Yeah, no, really. So, you know, sometimes there's a mellowing. Um, it, it, it's hard to pin down, but um, unfortunately, and this happened a lot in Sacramento. There would be something really you know, causing a chasm. Uh, uh, but then later on, someone might need a vote. So all of us, I always made the joke of, you know, uh, hi, how are you? And uh, that's a nice tie. You you burnt my house down and <laughs> killed my kids and wife, but let's, you know, the motivation was a collaboration that might be beneficial yeah. uh, to one or two of the parties, but it didn't come out of, you know, what a wonderful person. Now, you know, uh, my friend uh, Eve, who worked with suicide prevention, she said, I always like happy endings, you know, and I always like to think uh, Romeo and Juliet uh, lived and lived happily ever after. So I'd like to think that maybe after a number of years, uh, some people have mellowed to, about me. Although, you know, I don't really think I've tempered anything. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I'm older. But I don't think that uh, the the energy is subsided. And in, 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 they do say that your brain, and it's still there, as you get older, the part that um, uh, responds and to empathy grows. So supposedly, when you're older, you have more empathy, um, and that's fine too. But you know, don't mess with things that we hold dear. You know. Yeah, I was kind of hoping that, you know, we'd see you and Arnold Schwarzenegger teaming up to fight uh, fight crime or something. Arm wrestling, yeah. <laughs> we could oil each, oil each other up, you know. <laughs> he, um, he used to not live in the governor's mansion. He lived in a non-union hotel across the street from the Capitol building. And, I, you know, you could walk there in two minutes. And he would get the full regalia, his limo. The escort rum, 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 go up the driveway, cross the street, pull into the driveway of the Hyatt, and then go to his penthouse. So, <laughs> what about? I uh, try to emulate that, but it didn't. Uh, <laughs> what about your your thoughts on our, our where your relationship is or not? I don't know, Governor Gavin Newsom. I mean, you served alongside it, yeah. him as board of supervisor, and you were board president of the supervisors. 
uh, during that time. And so there was a great story in here about a clash on serving um, in committees and chairing committees. And it just didn't really seem like, you know, you were the best yeah. of friends. <laughs> so, no, no, yeah. we, we weren't. And um, we, we, uh, we clashed around policy uh, a lot. And uh, I think I still would. Uh, it's funny, I, I, I think if I know anybody well, I, I know our governor well. Uh, not that that always sat, <laughs> you know, perfect. Uh, and believe it or not, um, and I think even he says this, um, I cut him more slack than others. Some people would wake up in the morning and their whole thing was get Newsom. Um, I had other priorities, but I certainly had disagreement uh, disagreement with him. Now here's a little known fact, and uh, in the book there's one, one story. So um, in, or two stories probably, no, three, three. <laughs> When he was running for governor, I was a go-to guy for the press because I knew him and I people knew that we had riffs. And so they would call me to get criticism of Newsom. I didn't mind in the beginning because it was just my perspective, uh, certain you know criticisms, things like that. So a magazine guy, right at the end of the interview, you know, and I was critical. I said, well, I wish he had done it this way. Or at the end, he says, well, are you going to vote for him to me? And, you know, there was only the Looney Tunes Republican. And I said, yeah, I believe in voting. I'm going to hold his feet to the fire. Uh, but, you know, I'm also going to hold my nose and I'm going to vote for him. So I got a text from him that said, I'll take it. Thank you. So I guess he read. <laughs> so since then, we've had kind of a bromance every so often. Every so often we text each other. Uh, my husband says, oh, I think he has a crush. <laughs> so that in, in a sense, and I'm still critical of him, you know, but you know, there you are. He's the governor, you know. Yeah. Uh, while we're talking politicians and, and names, wow. rate our current mayor of San Francisco, London Breed. Yeah, you know, she, uh, politically, uh, we're, we're not in, in the, on the same uh, wavelength. Um, I think she was schooled differently. Um, I believe she's a smart woman. Uh, she certainly has a compelling backstory. But even with that, there are people who have similar backgrounds uh, and similar stories. Um, but the way they operate in terms of policy and, and politics, um, is not the same as as the current mayor, um, and um, the identity part. You know, the first African American woman. Yeah, yeah. I, I you know, I, I I like that. I get into that. Um, I think it's important, but it can't be the only thing. Um, and me, I wish she was more progressive in her thinking, and um, not so old school. Um, but just like with Gavin. Yeah. She's the mayor. What can I say? You know, so um, we'll see. How's that? I Here's a question I have. I mean, you ran for mayor, ran against uh, Mayor Willie Brown, as I had mentioned, and that was um, his, he was running for right, second yeah. term. And you you ran as a, a right, what do they call it? Right in. Yeah, right in. And yeah, um, you, surprised, you surprised a lot of people, um, especially what you'd referred to as the establishment or these established, you know, leaders, elected leaders. Um, so the question is, if you had won, if you'd actually won, you know, mm -hmm. that, that race, um, we might not have seen a Mayor Ed Lee, uh, maybe not even a Mayor London Breed. What do you think would have happened if you had won that race? Well, I think if you personalize it, you know, you have a different viewpoint and you really, you know, make names, um, you know, then right away you start thinking, well, you know, I liked Ed Lee. What if there'd been no, you just, in you know, you can't do the what if. Mm -hmm. um, that, that doesn't, that gets you nowhere. Um, well, I don't know. You know, I, I, I think it would definitely have represented the people speaking. I don't want to aggrandize myself, but you know that was quite a movement that happened, um, and it's we it nurtured me and and sustained me, and 
I think, you know, things don't happen fast. Um, and, but I do think we got Dean Preston and, and uh, Chessa uh, out of that, um, uh, that we, you know, the early parts of it, you know. And had I been married, you know, you can do a lot with, um, uh, I'm gonna tell you something contradictory. You can do a lot with uh, appointing people to commissions and uh, uh, how you work with the supervisors could be different. W one thing I would have changed is the strong mayor not the person, but the office. Our charter says that the office of our mayor is very strong. And so therefore checks and balances are not quite what they should be, especially in terms of budget. There's all kinds of fun things that happen with the budget out of any mayor's office. And I would like to, and I would have pushed for and used my platform for charter reform that would have reduced the role of the mayor as the final decision maker, arbitrary, more sharing, uh, uh, even though it would have been me. But see, for me, then I could have, um, the next term, if we got that through, I could have been ceremonial, have nice outfits, went to events, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wasn't threatened, in mm -hmm. other words. Uh, and I still believe in that. And someday I hope it happens. One of my most favorite bills um, that you worked on and, and passed, and it's still around, Healthy San Francisco. And yeah. you, know, you tell a story about actually being kicked out of a restaurant because of that bill. Oy vey, yeah. Um, well, the restaurateurs uh, didn't like it, the, uh, the, the coterie, I call them. And uh, you know, they have this restaurant association that's also national. And uh, you know, they're definitely um, you know, right of, of center. And of course, here in San Francisco, we have a little worshiping going uh, of the restaurant scene. Um, sadly, um, they're hurting now in a way that I don't think anybody wanted um, with, with the virus. However, um, they were very protective of uh, their uh, venues and they did not like Healthy San Francisco because they had a chip in. And um, they sued us three times uh, lost every time. Uh, and one time, uh, my husband to be and I stopped by a restaurant called range. Um, it basically happened because we were at an event that didn't have booze. So there's a lesson there somewhere, boys. And, uh, so I went in for a Manhattan and I knew the restaurant had gotten a star or something. What do I know? And the owner came up, she was right out of the movie frozen and said to me, well, you're not welcome here, get out. And I, I said, well, I want my drink. And she said, no, she told the bartender to take the drink away and uh, gave me my money back. And I thought, you know, who do you have to fuck to get a drink around here? So she kicked me out. I didn't make a scene because, you know, people don't know and they, you know, they, they make, make the wrong kind of assumptions. Uh, you know, they didn't know the backstory. But it, it was humiliating, uh, and it was awesome. It really pissed me off. And um, poor Carolus, my husband, was in the bathroom, so he didn't see anything. And he's looking for me. I'm out in the sidewalk, you know, scowling. Um, later on, she was uh, forced, I think, by the Restaurant Association to apologize. It was a pretty cold, hmm. removed. It, but it, she didn't really have to. The damage was done. Well, thank you for. Of course, I had big care. fantasies of closing the restaurant down and all that, but. Uh, well, thank you for healthcare for all San Francisco's or at San Francisco. Yeah, see, it worked out. It worked out. Maybe she has it now. <laughs> hey, Tom. I mean, we respect it. Yes, we've got some questions from our, our watchers, viewers. Uh, Sister Roma asks Tom, will you please tell your elevator joke? Oh, I think when I, I met uh, Roma, uh, there was some speechifying, and uh, I said, oh, I met, uh, I got on the elevator and I met so-and-so, who knows, Diane Feinstein something. Uh, Diane Feinstein was the elevator. And she said, going down? And I said, no, 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 just talking. <laughs> Thank you, Roma. <laughs> Scandalous at the Commonwealth Club. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll put a, a disclaimer on this one. Um, someone else asked, Tom, what was the hardest part of writing your book? Uh, putting my ass in the chair. <laughs> Just focusing you know, I, on I, I, I'm, I'm a proud, I'm a proud AD deer. You know, I, in my mind, there's a, there's a whole uh, amusement park happening. 
So <laughs> I, the focusing and the sitting down uh, was the hardest thing. And then I got cornered by John Gollinger, God love him, and Tim Redman. They said, we've been talking. I knew I was in trouble, but you keep talking about it and you're not doing it. How about if we sit down with you, transcribe it? And they, I mean, what a service. I mean, how lucky could anybody be? And um, so that got over that hump, but that was the hardest part. I want to build on that because the very first sentence of your book, it's in your acknowledgments, and uh, don't worry, I did read more than just the first page, but... That's fine, don't worry about it. The first sentence is, is, is really great. You say, writing something like this, one becomes self-involved and then delusional. Now, you use that to go on to talk about the other people who've, who've done things and worked with you and helped you, but I also just kind of wonder, what, what is that like to go through your life and try to figure out what stories you want to share, how you want to share them, what they meant to you? Uh, you know, what was that like emotionally to write the book? Well, I, yeah, actually, you, you nailed it because there were uh, certain stories and some of them, I, one of them I dealt with my father I, there, there, and I just had buried it, especially with the HIV AIDS crisis, you just bury it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you have what people call ghost wounds. So I'd say, oh, I want to tell this story, like the one about uh, the, the Kaiser, you know, uh, maybe I, I'll tell that story, but then you start talking about the situation um, that we all lived through. Uh, um, instead of, of course, the people we lost, and boom, there you are, the waterworks start, or, uh, you know, so, um, but it was cathartic as well. Um, sometimes the stories were tested, you know, it'd be something you might have told for a couple of years in your circle of friends. And um, uh, sometimes their response, uh, responsive to questions you've been asked in the past, or uh, maybe you pick up an idea from someone else's book, you think, you know, I could, I could explain that too. But mostly, since I was around during all the times that I've written about, I remember things very strongly and in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And I've seen other attempts to do that. And I thought, you know, that's not 100% true, which, you know, I, I understand, but that's been left out or he's been left out or, and I wanted to do my own um, take on, on things. So at least I'm on record and people will say, yeah, he's full of crap or he's, you know, but rather than <laughs> keep me complaining about it, uh, that would, that determined some of the stories too. You talked about, you know, your dream actually was to be in showbiz. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, you b became a politician and an activist and a different road from even your stand up, Teaching, uh, yeah. being a stand up comedian. But I think you, you actually did get your dream come true. You know, you've been featured in some films and red yeah. carpety stuff. I'm, 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 a, I'm very, I'm, I'm very, very grateful. Um, there were missed opportunities. And, you know, as you get older, you live with all that, you know. Um, but I, I think I'm, I'm a lucky guy. I, I really, really do. And um, um, we'll see what happens with this crisis now. Uh, to me, it's, it's almost, there are parallels to, to what happened with AIDS, of course, the scale. But when you have challenges like the, they call it Rona, huh? the Rona, it reveals a lot about people, good and bad, or some are good and some are bad. And uh, um, it's been kind of edifying that way, you know, watching it all happen. And of course, being scared shitless. Mm. Yeah. Um, another viewer asks, Tom, do you think the United States will ever replace the corporate secret software voting systems with the open source vote counting systems you advocated as a supervisor? I think that's Brent Turner. He's the guy who's most advocate. That is correct. Yes. Yeah, I see. <laughs> Wait, Swami Tommy. It's, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I want it. I see the states doing it. You know what's a good indicator, even though it's weird? It's like Caligula, you know, Trump going off on, on voting by mail. That shows it got their attention. That shows it's threatening, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah I always think there should be a paper trail. Uh, and God forbid, you know, in this November election, I don't know what shenanigans are going to be. You know, because you know they're so 
such amorality um, in the part of the White House. So we're going to have to be on um, and uh, you know be on alert. But I do. Uh, it's sensitizing people to the fact that we need open source voting and we need a paper trail, um, and, and hopefully it'll become a priority. Um, I know it's going to be, but you know, how long is it going to take? We don't know yet. Yeah, um, it does kind of bring up the question of. If you were in a room with Donald Trump, what would you shout at him? <laughs> Kiss my gay ass. <laughs> oh, term of endearment. That is really perfect. I guess that then we should definitely let people know they've got to get your book. I enjoyed oh. it. I burned through the pages in two hours. I'm lucky that you sent me a copy, but people should get their hands on it. So how can they do that? Well, there's two ways. There's two, uh, you know, obviously we can't go the traditional way now of going to bookstores and doing those kind of readings, et cetera, or go to clubs. Um, so we're doing everything online for the, for the nonce. And um, we will have an audio recording, but uh, we're going to wait a bit for the audio because I like to do it in a studio and, and you know, have it be, um, uh, have it be uh, high quality. Uh, so we could go to SFBG, S as in Sam, F as in phony, no, F as in Frank, um, B as in Bay, G as in Guardian, SFBG.com, or you can go kiss my gay ass at. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Kiss my gay ass.com. Kissmygayass.com. Oh. Get your copy oh, okay. right now. Yeah, leave the gay in there for people who aren't sure <laughs> <laughs> or, who, or who want to be offended. We yeah. we got a couple minutes left. Um, well, I, I, yeah, you, you know want to have a question? I, I mean, we, we've we've touched on this kind of obliquely a bit, but just personally, how are you doing right now? And being, are you totally staying at home? Are you okay? Or are you uh, handling it well? Yes. Um, you know, part of it is um, being older. Mm -hmm. um, you stick around a little more. You know, it's nice to be home with your honey because, uh, you know, there's always um, a lot of demands, um, you know, to, uh, and I'm flattered by them, you know, to speak or to please, can you attend this or I need your vote? And, you know, and I've been doing that for almost 50 years. So, it, in a way, um, I'm not going to say nice because I don't have as much choice. I, I wish we had more choice, but you know, be, being home is okay. Um, I do miss certain friends. I miss my granddaughters. I mean, you know, there's Skype and everything, but yeah. um, it's not the same. And um, uh, I sit home too, being amazed that we're dealing with this and going through this. And um, especially the response from DC you know, it's a life force. It drives me fucking crazy. Um, and um, so, you know, okay, but I am worried and uh, I am scared for my friends and, um, you know, always hopeful, but I do. It gives one pause hmm. to say the least, you know. Well, I get the last question and Tom gets the last words. We got a couple minutes left. Um, obviously, the book is inspirational. You've been uh, an inspiration, right, in the education community for students. So any, any words of encouragement, especially as we go through a year where we're not celebrating, we're not gathering, we won't have a pride, but basically <laughs> what people get out of your book and, uh, you know, what, we, what kind of hope we can continue to hold on to. Yeah, well, you know, I, I'm thinking of this term, you know, every, every saint ha, has a past and every sinner has a future. So hold on to that. Um, I think we need to be, and Milk was good about this. Um, we may, it's not assimilating, it's how we assimilate. We, we really need to own our, we are different queer people and that's good just like other uh, uh, cultures and, 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 and peoples, because it contributes you know, to the fabric. Um, so we never need to apologize for that. Uh, and we never need to become invisible. And we need to make sure that we're looking over our shoulder because I mean, if you, and Milk was good about this, as I mentioned, 
everything might seem okay now, but it may not be in, in the future. And, uh, you know, who, who could figure Trump and Pence uh, and all those reprobates and the nibbling, nibbling away of LGBT rights and the nibbling, nibbling away of African-American voter thing, you know? So uh, the, uh, don't be complacent, be yourself. By the way, have fun. Mm. Don't forget to be have, have fun. You know, when I was uh, young, I was a disco bunny. I confess, and um, I would teach in the daytime, and then I would go to demonstrations at night, and then we would go dancing and disco, and then whatever happened. Uh, so that's my advice. Love it. Tom Amiano, Stay grab his it. book at kissmygayass.com. John. <laughs> And thank you for joining us, Tom. And thank you for watching and listening to this program. Uh, you can find out more programs we have coming up at commonwealthclub.org slash online. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>